the movie really altered my trajectory of my life. I, I really can't imagine focusing on anything else other than having people rise up to create a better world. Um, I think I'll, I'll kind of go to the end of my days championing that. So there'll be many more projects over the years really supporting that, that view of the world that we, the people together can invent a world that works for all of us, that works for the planet. It's completely within our capacity. Michael Sean Conaway is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Lojas Regenerative Foundation. Michael Sean is endlessly curious about how life works, why we do things, the way we do, and how we might do them differently. This led him to become a phenomenological philosopher someone who examines life from the way life shows up moment to moment. His current work in being and time is rooted in this tradition. Michael Sean's purpose in life is to unleash greatness, to bring about a thriving future. His mission is to empower and accelerate the redesign of our failing systems, to create an anti-fragile, anti-rival world, one that works for all something I really like. To this end, he helped to create the field of generative futurism, the practice of generating or envisioning desirable futures at near and long time time frames, backcasting, steps it would take to realize that future, and then acting to take those steps moving forward in time. Simply put, this is the capacity to see and realize futures. Michael Sean is a frequent speaker on long-term strategy, the future and being and time. His keynotes have the uncanny power to shift culture by building a new narrative for the audience. His talks are journeys designed to leave the audience seeing from a new reality. He is the founder of five highly successful ventures an award-winning filmmaker, editor, publisher of Proof Magazine, founder of Boldly Now, an entrepreneur education platform, and CEO of StoryWorks, a social impact creative agency, and the nonprofit Generative Futures Initiative. We're going to talk a little bit today of one reason why he's here, and that is his latest documentary feature, We Rise Up, a cultural shifting film featuring key global leaders. We Rise Up asks a fundamental question, what is success for humanity? Sean's been around the block and he started his uh, career in the mid nineties as a writer and director for video games. And by 2000, his creative agency StoryWorks became the go-to agency for high-tech companies looking to create visions of the future. Michael, Sean, it's so wonderful to have you on the podcast. It's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, you too, Mark. Really, really great to be here. Now, I could have gone on and on. My, maybe some would have thought, okay, wow, that's a long biography. You, you've done a lot. You've touched a lot of people's lives. You've come into interaction with a lot of people's lives. So I, I think it was truly fitting to, to give a little vision of of who you are, what you've done, and set that up. You and I first met each other in France at the La Grande Rex at a BOMA event, as a BOMA Global Summit, which was held in France, uh, in Paris, and uh, was a fabulous, beautiful old venue, um, mainly French talks. I believe mine was one of the few in English, and... Um, uh, really enjoyed it. And, and we met at, at the after kind of the social gathering and that and you told me about we rise up and some of the things you're working on. And, and, and we, we had some nice connections, which really sparked my interest because I had just finished another documentary film um, called now, which has since been out and come and come and gone and been released. Your release for we rise up, was it right in the heart of the pandemic? When, when was the official release and, and how did that go? And what was the experiences that you have releasing a documentary in crazy times? Was it 
was it meant to be? Yeah, it was, um, it's, I mean, it, the whole, you know, pandemic impact on filmmaking and filmmakers was terrible. If you're in the middle of a project trying to shoot, you basically had to shut down. Uh, we were just about to start distribution in 2019, uh, 2020 when, when uh, we met. And then of course, you know, we had all these plans the way we were gonna release and whatnot, and they were gonna be happening in the spring. Obviously by March, we, we shelved those plans. And at first we thought, well, we'll just wait a little bit. You know, I think we were all in that place. We'll just wait a little bit. Let's see what happens uh, in the next uh, coming months. And uh, eventually we, we dis you know, discovered like, like everybody else that this was a new, a new reality, a new way of, of kind of having to, to deal with the world. And so we, we decided to do a digital launch, a purely digital launch. We'd already had a really great um, successful run of, of, um, of film festivals and stuff all over the world. So a lot of people had had the chance to already see the film in, in theaters. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a big disruption. Uh, and yeah, we, we finally released in December this past year uh, on streaming platforms, Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, all those ones. And you can find, you can find them there. Uh, you can also find on Vimeo. I think there's a, I think we have Spanish as subtitles. We'll be trying to get some more subtitles on that in the, the coming months for sure to let people get a chance to see that. That, that was beautiful. And I mean, I'm glad it worked out and, and, and that that progress is there. I know a lot of um, directors, a lot of filmmakers really struggled. A lot of creatives in general struggled during this time because the systems our world operates on, especially in the movie industry, were not really up to speed for most production and distribution companies. There was a few who were, were very well placed, obviously Amazon and Netflix and a lot of the streaming formats were really right there and ready to jump on the, the opportunity to capture people at home and that. But many others were still stuck in these traditional distribution routes where movie theaters were closed and promotion ways were really closed. I, I wanted to know, before we jump into more about the documentary, just did you ever have any aha moments during this time or some learning lessons or things that you saw that uh, said, boy, we need to rise up. We need to change things. Things aren't working how they should be, especially during times of crisis. Yeah, really great question. I think that the film... You know, in the film, I got to interview a lot of people. Uh, we started filming in 2015. And so over a number of years, I was interviewing people just as kind of the notion of systems change was gathering some momentum amongst our, our small tribe. Um, you know, the and, and SGGs that were emerging and all these things were starting to coalesce. And that, so I kind of felt like I was trying to film uh, an emerging movement or maybe a, a, an emerging mindset would probably be even better said. And, and so, you know, the, looking at my business, the way I was doing a business is looking at, at what we did around filmmaking and trying to tell these stories. I, I knew that what we were making wasn't even fit for the distribution models and the traditional business out there in film as it was. Um, and in fact, we'll get to this later. I mean, you know, we start talking about economics and things like that. The, the economics of making a film like this are, are they're serving the wrong master. Um, you know, that the kind of economic incentive or financial incentive embedded in the film is trying to, you know, break down systems and break down the way we think about economics is kind of nonsensical. And uh, so we knew that, but we had investors and we, need, you know, we needed to, to, to work in the traditional system to make sure our investors could get some money back. Um, so, but it always felt to me like we were, we were paddling the wrong direction in the stream. And that being said, it's a really great example of Okay, great, Michael, Sean, you can help us imagine these kind of far out futures. Maybe there's no ownership of things or maybe we don't have to pay for things like movies. But what does that do for me today? Um, like, how do I deal with this prevailing system? And I think that's the, I mean, that's some frustration is the first word that comes to mind. That's the kind of the frustrating fact of being able to imagine perhaps better ways for us to interact and exchange value, maybe better at to, ways to interact as cultures anti-racist ways and would be one example I can give you that, but we don't have yet the, the structures in place to do that. Um, if you're in that, that mode right now, I'd say, just keep going. 
you're a pioneer, you're going to be breaking new ground and you may or may not succeed in the old model, but you've got to get examples of, of media and conversations, books out there that allow, especially the next generation to pick up on that and go, oh, I could, I could, that. I could, I could do that. I could move that forward. So I think our, our hope was always to impact the conversation in general and, and give benefit to that. And then dealing with the, the kind of traditional movie model is, was something we knew we had to do um, and did quite well at it. I don't, I don't, I want to say that we, you know, we didn't do well, uh, but in a way that it's, it's not the point of, of making these kinds of media. And I want to just encourage anybody who has an idea to get out there and make it even if it's a short or anything. It's the world really needs these, these stories and messages. So it was rough during COVID, but uh, it was kind of what was expected anyway, in, in a strange way for us and our team. You see that uh, the model is shifting in general uh, throughout the industry of filmmaking that uh, movies are and documentaries and film are being made mainly for streaming purposes now that it's changing a little bit because of the uh, um, kind of the insecurities of the traditional distribution and theater ways uh how have you noticed anything that you can maybe touch or tell us about that's interesting yeah it has to be streaming for anybody who's doing a, a project that's got a positive impact um documentaries in general uh maybe some kind of creative uh, narrative project that maybe shows a different way of living life it, it, it's got to be streaming and and the sad news is that Really, you know, like like our time of coming up in the '80s and '90s was kind of the launch pad of independent cinema. Uh, I mean, I still I still remember the you know art house movie theaters when I went to college. There was two in the town I went to, and went to Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight and saw all kinds of weird foreign films in those those places. And today, those two theaters that I went to are no longer theaters. They no longer show movies. Um, and in general, Hollywood has moved more and more to these tentpole, you know, uh, 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 style movies. I'm thinking of the Marvel Universe type stuff. They are more and more about, um, you know, maximizing concentration of followers, people who engage in those stories, and then by thereby, you know, making really, really, really large sums of money and not having a huge amount of interest in, in artistic films or documentaries. Um, you know, you have to go back to Michael Moore's days before you have kind of successful documentaries in theaters. It's kind of crazy. Um, and then the, they, of course, put money into art films for the Academy Awards run. And those films usually release in November, December, and they're really good films. And thank goodness we have uh, some incentive for investing into films that, that maybe reveal more about, about human nature. It's kind of a sad state of affairs, though. I mean, I'm I'm ready for some kind of rebel crew of 20-year-olds to you know, start making movies and only releasing them on a small platform that you have to, you know, make a blood oath to get on to see their great work or something. I don't know. I mean, it's, it just seems like the, the whole industry is ripe for creative and, and impact disruption. Um, but I think it will take a, a movement or a group of people going through it, you know, maybe with some kind of man, manifesto or something like that. I could see that being a very effective way that then could attract people to those messages, either just for impact reasons or for, for earnings reasons or, or the financial aspects of that as well, which have to be attended to in these projects that really cost a lot to produce. Wow, that, that's so interesting to hear because I, I am seeing the model shifting. I'm seeing yeah. like in, in the TikTok space, even in the, um, in the YouTube space where there's some pretty big productions um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say documentaries or feature films, but almost like series. One one of them is the uh, I think his name's the Beast or that's his uh, his name. You know, million seventy million followers for every one of the videos that he does, uh, just unbelievable. But the production behind it, where they creating, uh, you know, they purchased an island, they did movie sets. They're actually doing movie sets and some elaborate filming and and things to to pull off some of the things that it is where there's a lot of money involved and um, I'm seeing so some different models emerge in that respect as well. We Rise Up is an amazing documentary. I, I've watched it twice. Um, 
you know, a lot of the people in, in the film are my past idols and people I really like and admire. You not only had the Dalai Lama, Tony uh, Robert uh, Robbins, uh, Amia, Amina Mohammed and Richard Branson in it, but you had many others, Bob Proctor, um, John Mackey of Whole Foods Market, you know, Michael Franti, a, a musician, Craig Sheehan, Pantagonia, Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup Series, of course, Tom Chi, Google X, and I could go on and on. It's the who's who of uh, documentaries about a pretty um, interesting title, We Rise Up. And um, when you watch it, when you hear about it, about rising up to do our part in the world, to, to, to be part of the economics that's going on in our world, to be part of the voice that says, boy, I'm at disease. The system that I thought would work for me and would always work and be there is starting to fail me. That's I'm feeling at ease. I need to give my voice. I need to take some action. And so uh, a couple, couple of questions. I'm going to throw them out to you at the same time. One, you started in 2015 and you know, it, I, I think it's well over 20 people who you interviewed and maybe even more than that. Um, how did you keep that narrative and that process with the questioning, with the things that you discussed in a way that over a few years period until completion was timely, was saying the same things, had that consistent me message or was that not something you're looking for um, in that process? I, because I can't believe you did it. You did it. You did an amazing job. And, and secondly, how did you even get in that respect? Was it was it a, a documentary that you you brought to inception, or was there kind of a request for that as something that's been emerging more and more in our world? Yeah, two two great questions. Um, well, the 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 project got started with a, a conference in Boulder, Colorado, called the Success Success Three Summit. And uh, my producing partner, Kate Maloney, uh, organized that. And she brought a lot of those people there. Uh, she was friends with John Mackey, uh, uh, um, you know, people from kind of business and thought leadership came. And the, the idea was to have a conference in which they discussed, you know, if, if, if kind of success has been that you uh, acquire wealth, that you acquire, you know, uh, um, objects and, and you know, land and things like that, this kind of acquisition mode, or if you will, taking mode, that that's, that's a sign of success. So that's what success means. And taking and taking more and more is destroying our planet. Then maybe instead of just telling people, hey, you shouldn't do that, we should work to, to re-engineer the whole idea of success. What would be a successful human life that doesn't destroy the planet at the same time or create, you know, wealth inequality or create, you know, all these other problems that, that are, uh, that are extrinsic to the whole notion of being successful today. And it really also took in the notion of like, well, if I could just get wealthy today, then I could make a difference tomorrow. It really took on that. It's like, well, is that really viable? I mean, most of us are never going to be wealthy. So that means most of us are kind of prohibited from making a contribution or an impact. And what kind of came out of that conversation, which was started before the conference, and you know, a lot of the ideas were there before the conference happened and it came to fruition in a lot of the conversation there was that contribution was a much better model of success. How much am I giving, not how much am I taking? And then, and then what, not just giving, but specifically giving to the things that I care about. So what, what is of greatest importance to me? What do I deeply love and deeply care about? If I can make a contribution to that, if I'm making a difference in that, then uh, success becomes an intrinsically rewarded thing. I feel like the thing that I really care about is getting better. And then I, that makes me feel good because I care about it so much. And then I love it some more and it gets better. And then that makes me feel good because it's getting better. And so we get into this, this um, cycle of virtue which the old model has a, you know, this cycle of detriment, you know, the more and more success you get, the more and more bad things happen, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, call out the, the billionaires on the planet, but it's, it's a really difficult position 
even once you get there, now you've got you know hundreds of financial advisors and lawyers that are keeping you from doing anything of any good with your money. They're keeping the structure in place, and and your you know your capacity to even understand what impact you can make with a million dollars becomes very very difficult. So, based upon this notion of well, what what how would we actually communicate this notion of why don't we move from uh, you know from from taking to giving or from consumption to contribution? What what would how would we do that in a movie form? And so we interviewed everybody that came there and talked. They must have interviewed thirty people in a in a week. It was a grueling. They were having a conference. I was having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with everybody in a, a darkened room. Um, and then from there, it's like we, we got through that and we thought we we're just going to cut a little short film through it. And we went through the, the rushes, all the, the interviews, and we were just, well, I was just, I was so moved by the things people were saying. And you know, there's a quality when you're in a conversation, when somebody's saying something, kind of one of the times they've said it for the first time, but they're really lit up about it. And that's the kind of material we're getting back. Like people were really profoundly excited by the, the realizations that we're having about this stuff. And that led us into, well, if this isn't going to be a short, it's going to be a longer film. We got to interview more people. And then we started asking people on our network and everybody knew somebody. And so we just flew around, you know, I was at WAF one year, you know, we, I went, I went to India, I went to London. We, we were all over the United States. And in the end, Mark, you'll, you won't believe it. I, I interviewed over 150 people and every single one of those interviews was about an hour interview. So I had, to make a 90 minute movie, I had a hundred and, you know, 150 hours of interview footage. And um, so you, you ask, how do we, how did that, that kind of have a thread to it? How did it come to be kind of a cohesive thing? So there's two answers to that. One of them I'd really like to claim that's just not true with that is that I'm a genius. <laughs> I was a genius and I was able to kind of create this movie as I went along. I'm not, I'm not a genius like that. Um, but I did trust myself. And um, just like this conversation we're having today, I trusted dialogue. And so I would, I would walk in with these ideas swimming around in my head and usually one or two starter questions for an interview. But I, I didn't ask everybody the same questions. I just listened. And then as I listened, things came up that I found interesting. And when I found something interesting, I'd just dive into that and we'd talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we got to go to Sundance uh, uh, to, to do an event there for the film um, in 2019. And uh, three months prior, I still didn't have a movie. <laughs> I was like, I had all this stuff cut together and there's some great stuff in there, but it wasn't a movie. It was just a, a bunch of stuff. And I had a number of screenings uh, with close confidants and people that I trusted in the world. And I got some some strong criticism and some strong feedback. And uh, my assistant editor at the, name, at the time, a guy named Tyler Wallace, like, really wanted to, to fix it. And he sat me down and he tried to fix it. And I got really frustrated with him. I said, just give me a couple of days. And um, it was right around Thanksgiving time. And I, I literally just shut down, stopped thinking about the film, but just let these kinds of ideas flow around in my head. And uh, first week of December, I reorganized the entire film, recut it. Uh, brought in our, our uh, friend um, uh, Princier to do some voiceovers to do a poem. We'd already done one piece for the film. And within about a three week period, about four weeks before Sundance, I finally had a film. So um, the, the genius wasn't being able to see it as we were doing it. It was really being able to listen as we went through and then continuously listen to how the pieces fit together. Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it was really, really hard. Uh, but in the end, I think we end up with a, you know, I say it's a Greek chorus film. We get a bunch of people saying the same lines, if you will, together versus somebody's idea of how this should be. Now, that's different than a lot of films you've seen before, people have seen before. It's not, um, it's not a standard documentary film because it is really many voices kind of being woven together in one. And it requires some, I mean, I don't know about you, it requires some, uh, concentration while you watch the film you have to listen carefully and you have to, you, to really yeah. follow the threads so there's a couple of things there one i don't know how the hell you did it 150 hours into 90 minutes and I, I maybe you didn't have this but i i can imagine myself that i would be like no uh, there's so much good content i just want to put this in instead of you know the 90 minutes you're like yeah, but it's a 24 hour movie now. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it, you know, it's a, a sequel because you're like, I, 
I just want to include it all because there's so many nuggets of wisdom. So I imagine to hone it down to even 90 minutes was really frustrating. One, one person I didn't mention, I'm probably getting his name wrong. Y'all are going to have to help me is the, the poet is his name, Prince, Prince EA, Prince EA and yeah. fabulous. The, the, I mean, he, I've watched him before and seen him in, in many different spots, but just the poetry and the way he kind of from beginning to end also helps to, to do the weaving. I thought that was fabulous how you did that. And and really enjoyable because what he he said and other things that I've seen just really resonates and is so eye opening and um and the and the just the truth you get this beautiful feeling for it and I really like that in the movie so thank you for that yeah that was um, a great collaboration um, I did most of the writing of all that stuff um, and then he would come in and, you know, like add his pieces and then we would record it and listen back to it and we would refine it. Um, but he's, he's, you know, he's an example of somebody who's kind of reinventing the media model, you know, in, in YouTube and he, he does quite well for himself in that. And then he uses it as a platform to tackle what he thinks are some of the world's biggest, you know, problems and ills from the, the, the place where he's standing. So a great example of somebody using media as a way to make a contribution. Um, and, in, you know, like in this system, you have to find a way to have that actually provide for your life as well. Um, we definitely don't, you know, I don't want to advocate that people just do good and, and, you know, live out of a VW van, and, you know, like dumpster dive for food. That's not the point. The point is not to not have a good life. It's to make your life meaningful and make it, make it count for something, something other than, um, kind of the, the hollow material wealth or hollow material gains. There's a lot of research about that. Once you hit a certain level of, of sufficiency, once you can pay your bills, have adequate health care, be able to provide you education for your family, be able to eat healthy. Uh, in other words, when the basics no longer, you have to no longer cut the corners on the basics, extra money doesn't really make that much a difference. Maybe you drive a nicer car, maybe you go on a bigger vacation, but usually what that means is people continuously overextend themselves and now they're driving a bigger car, but now they find more urgency to make more money because they don't quite, quite have enough money to drive the bigger car. And uh, it's insidious. It's really, it's really that the system we're living in as far as our, our well-being being tied to our financial success and our ability to make an impact being tied to financial success is it's very frustrating to me. Now we have to work with that. You know, there's not, there's no way around it at this point. And there are some people, actually, I have a friend who's doing a, a very small uh, uh, universal basic income experiment. It's, it's her and her five friends, and they've pooled a bunch of money they made in crypto, and then they, they live off the same amount of money. And then there's enough money for everybody to live, you know, like a, a, a good life. She's doing an experiment. I'm like, that's what we need. We need crazy people who will try these things, not just a you know, intellectual exercise, but, but real, uh, real experiments. I'm, I'm super um, appreciative of that, of people getting into action about stuff. And That's amazing. We need, we need about um, 10 billion uh, uh, um, of, well, we actually need 1 billion people doing that for the, for the potential in the future so that we can really have some new models, some new economic models, some new systems out there that are twist on universal basic income. I really like that. Before we go too far away from we rise up, I want to I want to know. So, uh, not only the people in in the documentary, but do you have some kind of a takeaway, a group that can get together, a place where they can go if the the documentary resonated with them, where they can go more for action to kind of collaborate to to find group and and some action, and, and, and then the others. What's the resonance been? What's the feedback that you've received on it? And, and what are you finding? Yeah, um, the feedback's been great. I mean, we uh, on our Facebook page, the We Rise Up um, uh, Facebook page, you'll see tons and tons of quotes. We get, we get people emailing us every week about the impact the film had upon them. Um, I want to say the film's not for everybody. Um, it's, it, it requires some kind of intellectual capacity to, to think about something. So if, if somebody's in a, a state where they don't have the privilege to do that, and I acknowledge there's a lot of people that are, you know, just working hard to get by and things like that, that it makes it a little bit more challenging. Not that the film can't make a big impact. Um, 
for them as well. But I, I think it takes some privilege to be con- able to consider some of these things. And I want to just right off the bat, acknowledge that. And, you know, for myself, especially, I know that I have just a, a great privilege to be somebody who's able to engage in philosophy and engage in futurism, um, you know, which means that, that my life, my basic life for myself, my wife, my kids is, is taken care of in a lot of ways, you know, through, through my hard work and labor. Not, I'm not saying it's not, but it's definitely through privilege, through the, the axiom of privilege. Um, it's been great, the reaction. So you also ask about, you know, like how can people get involved in this kind of stuff and, and move it forward? Well, the, the basic lesson of the film is discover what your gifts are, figure out what your purpose in life is, what's important to you, what you'd like to make a difference in, and then figure out a way to do that. Do that by yourself or do that with others on a very, very small local level or in larger, you know, national, international levels. It's really what is in your future that that matters in regards to that, and so I've I've keep I keep starting projects to try to support that community. That the first is I've done a podcast, so you can uh, go look at the Boldly Now show on on podcast platforms and YouTube, uh, and that's conversations like we're having today, just trying to get people into conversation with these. So instead of having to just get to watch ninety minutes, you get to watch them one hour at a time, and as we make. Them, which I think is really exciting to have these longer conversations about the topics. Uh, two, we've built an educational platform at Boldly Now, which takes you through to like it's a it's an app that takes you through an interactive process and video based process to figure these things out to support you. Um, and that's been really successful. We're getting ready to do a We Rise Up specific launch of that at the end of the summer. So uh, be be looking out for that. And you can find that in the App Store at um, uh, Boldly U, I think we called it in the App Store, or you can go to bold.ly and find it on there. And then finally, we started this magazine called Proof, Proof of the Thriving Future. I got really frustrated that I couldn't find any media about what was going on out in the world that was really great the things that were really moving us forward to thriving, that were moving us towards these new models. I, I, I grew so frustrated that I just decided to do something myself. So a couple of us came together, we pulled together articles, you know, once a month, once every six weeks about a topic. It's a theme-based magazine. I write an editorial, but we write a couple of other pieces, usually like a 10 steps, how 10 steps to be peaceful in a time of war is the one that just came out recently talking about the Ukrainian war. Um, and we, and we have now, uh, I think we're in our 30 something issue. I can't remember. Uh, we, are, we are now really starting to amass a back catalog in different areas of, of stories about people doing really great things. And I, it's, it's so fundamental to being able to make an impact in the world or make a contribution to be able to believe that it matters. Um, you know, kind of the cynicist and the, the voice of resignation is this world is screwed and I can't do anything to make it any better. And my life is screwed and I can't do anything to make that better. And, and we get down and I think, I think popular media just reinforces this over and over. There's so much bad news that I can barely even stand to read the headline to that it, 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 it wears me down. So improve. We don't. It's not that we shy away from hard news. We we talk we talk about things that don't work in the world. We talk about you know about use of petroleum and things like that. We talk about the tough topics, but we talk about the tough topic and then who's making progress on that. Who what are, what are we doing on that? Um, and my promise to anybody that watches Re Rise Up is you know like you can you can message me through Facebook or LinkedIn or if you want to hear a question, I'll try to get it answered. Um, I, you know I think. The movie before I had been a futurist and a storyteller and you know done purpose work and all these things, but the movie really altered my trajectory of my life. I I really can't imagine focusing on anything else other than having people rise up to create a better world. Um, I think I'll I'll kind of go to the end of my days championing that. So there'll be many more projects over the years really supporting that that view of the world that we the people together can invent a world that works for all of us, that works for the planet. It's completely within our capacity. Now, can we get organized and do that? Well, that future will, will, will be resolved in the coming years, you know, maybe even the next 10, 10 years being the most pivotal time in a way in human history, um, especially when it comes to existential threats and all the stuff that you and I know and, and talk about. <laughs> I love that. That's real beautiful. Um, and thank you for kind of setting that tone and, and and giving us that feedback so that we know where it's going. You mentioned knowing your why, your purpose mm-hmm. for existing in, in some respects. So 
we both know Simon Sinek's the Golden Circle. Start with why I'm a graduate of his course and um, also strongly believe in that. I, uh, Bob Proctor was in your movie. I used to be a coach. I got coaching from Bob Proctor, um, Jim Rohn as well. Um, many uh, Lisa Nichols, um, many many others. Um, the other one is John P. Strzelecki. He said, he talks about, you know, was today a museum day of your life? You know, if you were going to give somebody a tour of your life's museum, would today be a day that you would be proud to show them, mm -hmm. give them a tour of today, of what you did today? And he has this thing called purpose for existing as well. So it's all about the big five for life and what's your purpose for existing. What kind of, how, how did you come to your why, your purpose? How did, how did you discover that? And how, how many areas out there through this entire process, 150, you know, 100 interviews, 150 hours worth of footage, did you see where are the sources that people are going to find that purpose? And more so than that, is there something that happens before hmm they begin the journey to, to want to discover it. Is there a shock? Is there something that nudges them to say, Oh man, what's this world all about? Is it, you know, is there is a process in that? Yeah. Um, so the first question is how to end up with, with my purpose statement, which is, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, my purpose is to unleash the greatness of human beings to create a thriving planet. So I, that's a purpose I've been working on and I, it's a work in progress. I'm always changing words and thinking about it. Unleashing, unleashing became a new word a couple of three years ago. Um, uh, I started that process uh, in 2009, I want to say. I had a, a course that I was taking called Credibility, Impact and Influence. It was a nine month leadership program for executives. Um, and uh, we had to come up with our purpose statement. We also had to come up with the shadow side of that, which is our shtick. What is the way in which that we get our way in the world? We basically bully the world to get our way. So the opposite of our purpose, which was um, not much fun to, to work on, especially to have a, a, a dedicated cohort of people helping you see how, uh, you know, how you manipulated the world to get what you wanted. But the upside of, of both of those processes to look deeply at how I had managed to win up into that point in my life, to have things go my way, you know, not, not that that's bad, but that I did it in a way that was uh, not conscious and not really producing for other people, but producing for me. And then, then goes through this process of trying to invent a purpose. Um, another one of those moments that just profoundly altered who I was. I didn't ever see myself through the lens of, of what meaning I was bringing to the world. I was always a seeker of meaning. Like, what does it mean? What does life mean? Is it life meaningless? Um, eventually, I came to the conclusion that there is no intrinsic meaning in life except for life. Life is its own meaning. And it's its own expression. It's us who sit back and think about it and ponder, does this have meaning or not? And for the human being, having meaning is really, really important. Um, if we get caught in a cycle of feeling meaningless about things, then life looks pretty bleak. Now, whether or not meaning has uh, any existence in reality or not is a real debatable topic. It is for, my, for me and where I stand, it is a, what we call a linguistic abstraction. It's a word that only exists in the domain of, la of language. When we say something has meaning, it's something that human beings give to a set of circumstances or a set of phenomena, things happening. We bring the meaning to things. Um, and that's a very modern point of view, by the way, you know, a, a, an older kind of biblical point of view would say that the, 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 the God or gods provides the meaning. But in the kind of a modern context, we provide the meaning. And, and what I found, especially after starting to articulate my purpose, which, by the way, was like five sentences long. It was huge. It was there's so much stuff in there that had to be weeded out over the years, um, was that when I when I kept my eye on my purpose, then the things that I did either had meaning or they didn't have meaning. And really quickly, I started abandoning the ones that just didn't have any meaning for me or didn't express my, my purpose. And um, yeah, it led me into a place where I, 
I suddenly felt fulfilled in everything I was doing. Before it was kind of like, was that a good project? Meant was it creative? Did I get to invent something really, you know, interesting? I came from directing television commercials and doing uh, creative work for for advertising and marketing. Did I get to do something that was exciting, or do we make a lot of money doing that? And that became really less interesting. And what suddenly became more interesting is. Did I invent something that will make a difference for people, that will free people, that will unleash them? And how much of a difference? And then the money side started, it became a problem. It's like, oh goodness, I forgot to make some money on that. We should, we should attend to that sometimes. So literally, like um, the way in which I existed in the world completely changed. And it doesn't, I want to say a couple of things. It doesn't matter how you come about inventing your purpose. It doesn't matter even if you do a good job at it. All you have to do is believe it. Um, even if, if it is not the sexiest purpose you've ever, ever in, done, just inventing a purpose and then investing yourself into it has the effect of fulfillment and directing and, and sending you in a way that's important. And we don't have a purpose. Like you're not going to you know, cut me open and find my purpose in there. Purpose is something of creation. I created my purpose. I created my purpose to give me meaning in life. And it does. It's a magic trick I know the magic of. It's not like I'm trying to fool myself. I know that I invented it. I know that it, it's something I invented to create this positive impact, and then it does. And then the great thing about that is that means that if it no longer fits, if I get to a point where it's no longer satisfying or no longer fulfilling, I'm free to invent another purpose. I'm invent, free to reimagine my purpose at any time so that I have the capacity to be what I wish to be in the world not what the world puts on me or what other people might say I should be, but really to be what I wish to be. Uh, and so it, it kind of ticks the box of being sovereign, really being able to you know, be your own sovereign self. It, has a, it ticks the box of being unique, but it also has this, this kind of larger reflection, this larger world that I exist in. And I think most of the great purposes do have this quality of service or, or contribution. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's fundamental, actually, to being a human being in this age, especially if you want to make any difference in the world. I've never heard it said so eloquently, and that that is absolutely perfect because it will resonate with a lot of people. It is truly um, not only sovereign, but it's this, uh, it's almost like a magic trick because you get to be the creator. You are the creator to live the the purpose and way your soul intended to live and you're part of that creation process which is nice and and when when you do that it's your baby you have ownership you have empowerment you're you're you have the sovereign uh, ability and then you're the motivator you're the boss to get up and go and to do it and the thing that i that i really learned is it is a huge motivator to when there are no bosses, when there is no time card to punch, when there is nobody looking over to make sure you're getting that task done, it's enough to go well beyond. Usually we're our own worst enemy in that respect. We'll end up working a lot harder or missing lunch or dinner or doing other things to see that fulfilled or see our us move in that direction. Uh, and I really love how, how you so eloquently put it. Before we told totally you, wait, wait, wait. I, I want to know. I want to. I want to interrupt you. So, how did you? How did you? How did purpose work go for you? You did cynic work because uh -huh. that's the first time you did I, that. I, no, 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 no. So I'd done it many years before. Uh, Rhonda Burns and uh, um, I did it with uh, the Secret. I did it with Bob Proctor. I did it with Jim Rohn. Yeah. Did it with many others along along the way. And. Um, the the real really first great experience I had was from my mother. She was one of probably the my not only my best friend but my best mentor of kind of getting me excited about creating my own purpose and that the mm -hmm. the world's my oyster. Not only am I a crew member on this beautiful spaceship Earth, but I I have some ability to steer the path that that my life takes. And and she she really gave me that, and that was my really first experience. But um, the the true power came really after I took the Simon Sinek uh, course and came up also multiple sent it was it was supposed to be one sentence and I ended up being a paragraph so to say uh, my purpose is really to empower billions of global citizens to live an adaptive lifestyle of health and sustainability 
within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. And, yeah. and I do that. I've been, I've been doing that ever since. And I haven't reached the billions yet, but I haven't given up the, the mission. I've definitely reached millions. And it, it's I do it in many different ways. I write, I do documentaries, I do videos, I do podcasts. I speak at a lot of big events. And I really want to spark people with their own empowerment, that they can find their why, that they can also get excited about the many things that we can do as crew members of the spaceship Earth that don't mean we're working for the man or that we're not slaves or peasants, that we can really kind of guide our future in life. And this is this, 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 it's better than any self-sovereign identification any government or anybody could give you to have this freedom in place uh, on, on our planet. And it's been, it's been fabulous. So, and ever since that, it's really, it's like, it, it's, I hate to say it's magic, but it's just such a powerful potion for, for a, a beautiful life and a beautiful future. Yeah, magic like an incantation, right? You just say your yeah. purpose, it becomes present. Well, I just wanna say that, um, I, the reason I asked that is, and I was hoping you would, would share your purpose is that, my um, my assertion is that that people who have really strong purposes, that their purpose shows up in the room when they show up and they don't have to say what their purpose is. It just shows up like you can hear them and they're talking what they're passionate about, their their expression, what they get lit up by. You can sense their purpose. You can feel it. You don't have to have an articulation. But so it would, getting to hear yours was wonderful. It's like it really summed up who you are for me, like who you show up for me at, like the. Uh, you know, the within the sustainable, what do you say, the sustainable boundaries of our planet? Yeah, the safe, the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. You know, there's nine planetary boundaries and there's a safe green space in the middle mm -hmm. where where life is in balance and in harmony. And, uh, and there's a lot of good things. We're reaching a lot of tipping points, but I think we can we can we can regenerate our futures endlessly if we get back into those safe operating spaces. And, and there's some really beautiful ways and better models for life that we're going to touch upon hopefully here in a few few minutes um, that really can get us there. That that uh, people say, oh, that's hard. It takes a lot of discipline or this is some crazy tree hugger economic principle. Um, but no, they're not. They're just better models for life. And they're so fulfilling uh, in many aspects, uh, not just as an individual, but in, 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 in other aspects. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I'm signed up. Like, just let me know what you want from me. I'm I like, I'm, I'm all for that purpose, you know, like the, and I think that's another thing that, that purpose can give us, especially we, like once our purpose grows to impact the world, like, um, and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the models I, I really like is that, uh, you know, our our consciousness starts off as consciousness of self. In fact, it takes a while to be born, right? We become conscious as a, oh, I'm a, I'm a thing separate from my parents. And then through time, our, our consciousness and our love and our care expands to cover our family, let's say. And then in time, maybe it covers, uh, you know, like our extended family or people from my area of, of the planet, call it a town or uh, a country. And if you keep growing your consciousness, and Ken Wilber said this first, then you eventually have consciousness that, that cares about the whole planet. And if you keep going, then you end up with, you know, universal love for the universe. The, the, your consciousness has a, a love and care and concern for the universe. And so when people start having their purposes be more than just about themselves or their family or their company or their, their, their and I don't want to say it's, it's not a lower level of consciousness, it's consciousness and consciousness is beautiful. It's just consciousness of a larger space. And I'll do the same thing with time, our time, more time, bigger, bigger, longer expanses of time. When that happens inside of somebody's purpose or their, 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 their action in life, where the way they are living and conducting their life, it's, it's so compelling. It's so attractive. And it's not always, you know, like if you think of Elon Musk, I'm like, that guy is, he's half cocked and crazy, seems like to me when I read his stuff, but his compelling visions about electric cars, about, you know, you know, life on Mars or whatever it is, his compelling visions are so large that the visions themselves are enrolling. Like the person is, is secondary to, to the visions. And so when you've stated your purpose, I could just feel it come alive, that, that larger vision for the whole planet, for all human beings. And I'm like, yes. And I think, um, I mean, that's what we're, 
and, you know, we rise up. We're just asking you to say yes, to say yes to doing your part, whatever that is, to either sitting inside of, you know, Mark's vision and helping him out, which I'm 100% behind, or, you know, you getting into my vision of unleashing, you know, humanity to have a thriving future for future. All of those things, like, you, it's not that you have to, to come up with the, the biggest, most grand thing. It's just you have to be in service to whatever ones resonate for you, whatever ones call for you. And then your purpose is a, a place in that. Maybe I'm the communications officer for, for planet Earth, or I'm a I'm an engineer, or I'm a whatever. It's just as you as you see, as you see your own unique place, then you begin to realize that that like a puzzle, if we all fit together, then these kind of crazy ideas about new ways of you know, conducting life on the planet, exchanging value, living, uh, you know, in peace and harmony are pretty easy when you've got, you know, 8 billion people working on that problem. Yeah, if there's 80, it's pretty crazy. But if we can enroll your billions, then it's not crazy at all. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm right in line with yours and, and everything you say is so resonates. And I think it's, there's some really beautiful models for, um, not only of meaning, but for life in there that are really just, just absolutely fabulous. There's a few things that I really want to touch upon. One, before we kind of shift away from the filmmaking documentary stuff, much as I, I, when I shared this idea with you before, and you're also working on some, some other things. We, all our media that we see out there is very dystopic nowadays. There's not a lot of, you know, there's TED Talks and then there's kind of a black mirror. It's also dystopic. And, and then a, your occasional documentary that really gives you hope of, of a better future. But the most of them were fighting over resources, a very dystopian media, whether it's a series, a short or, or a movie or, or whatever it is. Um, we don't have a lot of media out there that show us what a resilient or regenerative or sustainable future looks like, what that world yeah. would look like if we get there by 2030 uh, or 2050 or 2070. What, what does that world that has really achieved all the sustainable development goals, which has achieved the Paris Agreement, which has achieved you know, the bigger, higher ambitions of life that, that where we should be striving for, what does that world look like compared to us pushing the now model, the model that we're living now around the world, Ukraine, Russia, the United States, where, wherever the Bolsonaro's, the Putin's, the Shays, however political that we want to get. But let's push those models out into the future. Are we all still hopeful? I, I can't think of one single model that we're operating on now. If we push that out in the future, I'll say, boy, I'm glad we stuck it out with that fossil fuel or that extractive economy or that capitalism because it's boy the future's so great i'm 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 worried i'm at disease and so to to reel in all the doom gloom of that how can we give people like star trek from our generation or even star wars which is a little bit dystopian too set a picture of what a future would look like if we stayed within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries and maybe even create that in into a series where every week like a desperate housewives or mash or something comes out every week that goes into multiple seasons of reruns so that it's ever present so that people can engineer do movie magic architectures design create that future that they're seeing now don't get me wrong I still think in the future, even if we reach all those beautiful, almost utopian ideas, we're still going to have divorce. We still might fight. We still might spit on each other, hurt each other, or, or find crazy ways to manipulate the system. But at least we're not killing humanity. At least we're not, you know, messing up the future generations. And so as, as a filmmaker, as somebody who creates these visions, and even verbally, you've just what you've told us about your the why and the purpose and how that how that works for me i'm i can put that into visual things in my mind i'm like ah, i i'm i'm sold i bought into this sign me up i'm on board let's go because that's the world i want to live in how can we do that with the the entertainment the movie the media industry 
you know, do we need to call up Tyler Paris Studios and, and or, you know, get Leonardo DiCaprio? What do we need to do to get us in a different viewing? On I don't I don't want to numb people. I don't want to overload them with or kind of I, there's a negative force of that where we're kind of, you know, this new world order or what, whatever is kind of like, you know, that. But just so that we can have a different idea of what it's like. What, what are your thoughts on that? And do you see there's some possibilities we could do that? Hell, can we work on a project like that? Done. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's my, my, I guess one of my biggest passions right now. I, I, you know, I think, you know, I, I firmly believe that we live into the future we imagine. So if we're constantly imagining a future where computers are going to kill us all, we're going to invent that. That's just like, it's like if you're skiing and you keep thinking, I'm going to hit a tree and you keep looking at the trees, it's pretty likely you're going to smack into a tree at some point. You know, you focus on something and then the, you know, the brain through cognitive bias and all these other things start creating the conditions for that to occur. You start noticing, oh man, look, there's the way this is going bad. Oh, there's a thing that I can see where that's going to lead. And then uh, movie makers just take that and amplify it. They make it the worst they could possibly make it. And, and they do it because it's it's compelling. I mean, the human being, you know, like we, if there's a car wreck on the opposite side of the highway, we're going to slow down and take a look. Not because it's good for us to take a look, but, but it's compelling because to the human animal, if I can learn something from a disaster for some other human animal, I could put that into place to be, to have a greater likelihood of surviving. It makes complete sense, but it makes sense for, you know, noticing that you shouldn't turn your back to the lake while you're drinking and a bear comes get you. I mean, it's like, it's a practical thing, but when it comes to media, you know, we can create a really dark story that our brain is completely absorbed by. And the, the exchange of value is not that I learn how to deal with Terminator robots better or how I deal with zombies better because there are no such thing. The, the exchange of value is I give my attention to it and the people who make that media make money. So there's no net benefit to me as a human animal to be staring at that, but the compulsion to do so is present. And I'm I'm guilty. I like a I like dystopian stories sometimes. Sometimes I have to. I have a hard night of sleeping afterwards. Like I'll go to bed and I'm like, wow, that's heavy. I don't know if I want to wrestle with that. And so I have certainly backed off from a lot of those things. But the question is, is should media be responsible for the future? I don't know. I mean, should probably a big word. Can it? Yes. Can we create viable visions of a thriving future for humanity that gives somebody an idea of what it looks like and gives us some motivation or something to aim for? Look, not everybody as a media maker or a visionary has a capacity to picture these things. In fact, I'm pretty sure most of us can't see those futures. But though, for those of us who have some idea, then we can generate those visions. We can share them with the world and it gives somebody, somebody things to work on. I remember when I was in college, I read uh, William Gibson's books about, you know, uh, uh, you know, virtual reality and the capacity to have the, the, the you know, what, what we're calling the metaverse now. Uh, but they have that, that world and, and that in the, those books, it, it was a computer brain interface. Well, I was so compelled reading those science fiction books. I dropped out of journalism school and went to computer engineering school because I wanted to figure out how to make computers and people talk. Now, that's the kind of media we need to be making that gets people to drop out of business school and go into engineering school or go into uh, uh, international relations or any kind of thing where they say, wow, I could, actually, I could actually learn something to be able to make that future happen. I wanna say not that future. I, I, wanna, I wanna be really clear. I really think that the, the future is a multiverse, that humans, human thriving and especially individual human thriving requires that we, we escape these kind of monolithic cultural identities, that we begin to fragment not into little tribes that fight each other for resources, but fragment into uh, worlds of concern and worlds of uh, care and concern, things that we love. Maybe I love cosplay and I want to go live in cosplay land, you know, or I want to go, that's, I want my community to be that, or maybe I love chess and I want chess to be a big part of my life. And that we could create, you know, future societies based upon all kinds of mixes of ingredients. There's not a way for human beings to live life. 
there is, a, like you said, there's a safe zone for us to do it so that all human beings can live life and all animals can live life. That's important. But we, we, we need a, a future that's a tapestry of different things. And media could really help with that. We could explore the kind of crazy worlds that human beings invent and crazy communities and crazy ways of exchanging values and or exchanging value or, or what work is or, or what love is or what relationship is, you know, like, like the, there's room for all of it um, as long as we don't harm other human beings or harm harm our ecosphere, harm harm our planet. And so I think this is a place that that not only you know filmmakers like me or or people who are futurists and like to to imagine the future and figure things out, not only it's it's not just something for us to do. We can take a leadership role there and really get the ball rolling. but the, I think for me, the idea is we really want to get everybody having a part to play in this. Uh, you know, in uh, in science fiction, we have a lot of these things where they do fan fiction, where people write other Star Wars films or other Star Wars stuff or a new Star Trek thing. And they just write these stories. Harry Potter, I know, has a bunch of it. And they write them not to become authors or to make a lot of money. They write them because they they love the the world so much. And uh, that's that's what we need. We need a, you know, a couple of billion people writing fan fiction for the future that works for all. And then we'll have plenty of blueprints. We'll have lots of things to try. So I'm um, yes, I, if we have, if we, if Leonardo DiCaprio is listening to this podcast, we need your help now or any major studio. One of the things that's difficult about non-dystopic future media is that it doesn't have that biological hook. It doesn't, the human being doesn't stop and, and look at the good thing going along the side of the road. Maybe if the little girl has a lemonade stand, you do stop and buy lemonade, but most of us just drive on by, right? And so there has to be some other um, supporting mechanism other than make it making lots of money, making a positive future for humanity, maybe motivating enough, but uh, the old system really only wants us to give our dollars to watch that stuff. So we have to find out, find a way to support it with economics. So it could be patronage, all kinds of things. There's lots of models that we can talk about, but um, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm on board for that as is definitely one of my major projects over the next decades to share lots of visions of that viable future of that you know, and then also there's crazy things, Mark, there's crazy economic models. Well, why not tell a story about it? Like I could give you the white paper on a crazy economic model and five people could read it and understand it. But if I could tell a, a, a short little, you know, 10 or 15 minute story about how life works in, you know, uh, 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 you know, non-competitive world, non-competitive land or, or uh, you know, then we could actually show like, oh, what would it look like if, if people weren't competing for resources? What, what would, how would they talk? How would they interact? Well, creative people can figure that out and give you a vision and, and see if you would want to move there. You can uh, think of it as a brochure for a future you might want to inhabit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, when we just to, on that point that you just mentioned, when we shift away from a competitive or, you know, we're each doing our own thing type of a model um, and we do more cooperation or, and sharing and other things, it turns into a harnessing of the exponential function. And that model explodes just like Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, uh, us and catapults humanity in the future. There's an ecological phenomenon called symbiosis that it's all about human evolution and how we can really get on that exponential path to stay up to speed with our developing world. The reason I, I, I know you're absolutely on board, the reason I, I, I mentioned the media aspect like I do is because I think it's a, uh, a tool that is and it's such a beautiful medium that we could use to really help us. So with Star Trek, none of that stuff existed. It was all movie magic, the tricorder, the hologram rooms, the transporter, the medical bay, all the things, the, the 3D food printer, the whatever they called it. Uh, that was all movie magic, interracial marriages or interracial relationships, no smoking. I could go on and on. And through that vision, it showed us not only a diverse future possibility, but it gave architects, engineers, and filmmakers the ability to say, how could we make that happen in some form similar and bring that into reality. And until we have that medium or something to, to visually stimulate humanity to think in a different way, to shift that mindset where we're not using our 
imagination quite as well as we should out of a media setting, out of a video or, or movie or something. Um, but uh, time and time again, there's been so many people that through documentaries, through films, through movie magic, have been inspired to go out and take action and make something happen or create it. There's one example of the illusionist. It's an old Austrian film with Edward Norton as a magician, an illusionist. And in that movie, there was a little locket that he made the princess and gave it to her uh, uh, um, um, uh, kind of as a sign of his love before they split up and came back. And I don't want to spoil the whole movie, but that locket was movie magic. It, it first was just a locket and then it turned to a heart and then it turned to a butterfly. And then when you opened it up, there was a two-sided picture of them inside that locket. And that was movie magic. That was three separate lockets. Yep. Someone saw that and said, oh my God, I got to have that. I got to give that to my wife. That's the most beautiful thing and show my love. And he contacted the studio. He looked online for, you know, replicas and said, is that possible? And was surprised to find out it was movie magic. And it bothered him so much that it didn't exist. He was an engineer and he figured out a way to make it happen. And the guy is such a successful business guy now. He's that's all he does is sell these lockets oh. and he's multimillionaire now and he's doing great and he's fulfilled and he's yeah. replicated that with many things. And th that's the inspiration I think humanity needs. And that's, that's why I asked that how can we help or nudge to, to get these in there and get away from the amygdala that leads and bleeds and, and moves towards to, to the leading and bleeding of, sustainable desirable future something like that and that that's kind of really why i brought it up yeah i think it's really important i i love you know we we run around with with you know communicator devices like star trek does. star trek is a great example too that it's one of the few um positive futures that we have um you've got human beings who are not warlike who want to um you know see other cultures in the universe uh uh, the next generation put forward this uh, idea of um, you know, non-colonialism, non-interference with other cultures so that they couldn't go in and, you know, meet another race and then change the course of their history. They had to hide their ships and things like that. And, you know, like that's that what the next generation's 90s show the, you know, we didn't even have anti-colonial terminology back then, but here they were demonstrating a, a world that, that considered that to be just, table stakes like we'll be anti-colonial it's just uh, you have to start with that and so they really pioneered a lot of these you know very positive things like you said uh, the anti-racist stuff with uh um uh you know interracial the thing one of the first interracial kisses on tv uh with kirk and uhura um and you know like many people of many different nationalities and the shows is pretty amazing um but maybe what's more amazing is that people didn't copy that. That didn't become that it, you know didn't become a thing. Now there is a, a genre of of science fiction out that people call hope hope punk, um, which is you know like cyberpunk before. It's like uh, speculative fiction that has hopeful themes and kind of kind of has this uh, more of an approach of 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 sharing you know what we could be as human beings. So uh, be on the lookout for for that that kind of of stuff. And those are those hope punk science fiction writers are the first people we should recruit mark we got to get them to come and bring their their genius you know futuristic brains to to thinking about how things can work and by the way we should bring some philosophers along for the ride and some engineers and some people who know systems thinking and you know we, we need a little uh, a little uh, team of of you know geniuses in their own domains to help us to um, not only create a vision, but to create visions that you can naturally imagine that lattice work backwards. So your engineer could see the final object, could see what materials is made out of, and he by himself self was able to make that journey from you know imagination to actual object. Well, for you know 30, 50, 100 year futures, you know it, it, it takes some other kind of organization to put all those things together. Um, you know, much like Gaudi and uh, uh, Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona, which is still not finished 100 years after his death. You know, it, it required something more than just a set of architectural drawings. It required all these 
hands and geniuses to come together to keep that project going. Well, in a way, what we need to do is we need to be the Gaudis of the world to have a vision for, you know, I know that it'll be a church that looks like a forest on the inside. Um, uh, we need that. And then we need the engineers and the, the people who are able to think, you know, systems thinkers to think, well, if you do that, though, it could put a lot of stress on this system. And maybe, maybe you maybe make that better. You make this worse. So somebody can make that that uh, help us to see that. And then thereby, I think also just so important, if we could give the vision, but also give the the backstory about how these thinkers talked about this. Like how do we imagine something happening in the future? And then how do we check to see if that thing we're imagining would actually be a beneficial for humanity? There's been so many things that we've invented as human beings that have really turned out bad. Um, so if we could you know, explore and invent new models of consideration, how do we invent and create with consideration for the impact of the, the creation? Even just sharing that story of how people come together to do that might be of fundamental importance to humanity to learn how that process goes. Um, there's a lot of value, I think, in every part of that that uh, that chain: the vision, the process, the people. Um, and um, right now, fortunately, we could share all that media. We could share a TV show and a behind-the-scenes thing at the same time. Um, maybe different groups of people working on that, and and thereby learn better how to do what we're doing. We don't want to generate visions for the future of humanity. Like, you know, we're people in an ivory castle, like there's five of us that get to imagine the future of humanity and everybody else has to do as we say. <laughs> That's the old model. We want to say there's, you know, 8 billion people who have the capacity to generate an amazing vision for the future of humanity. And any one of those 8 billion people may be somebody that comes up with an idea that becomes in the future fundamental to our successful living of life, for our sustainable living of life. We have to get people, enroll people, and train them to, um, to do this, to imagine this, these, these futures. And um, then we've got this, the 8 billion pop people population becomes our asset, not our, not our thing to struggle with. It's like, wow, we've got 8 billion people trying to solve this problem at the same time. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> Absolutely. The crazy thing is uh, that, again, Star Trek had its own economic model. There's a book, Treconomics, uh, such a fabulous book because it talked about, you know, Star Trek was not only sci-fi and these visions of the future and movie magic, but they came up with their own economic model, basically, where there was no money, yet people were doctors, lawyers, and security personnel and had these wonderful jobs. And there was also ranking in some respects, but there was no monetary policy or money, so to say, to hold it all together. Yet it worked beautifully. And that's like yeah. another vision of what are these other models? And we've tickled on it a little bit. You so nicely mentioned, you know, this uh, twist on universal basic income and kind of these local communities and that. And that's something that we have in common. We talk about a lot. You know, we're both doing futurism. We're both doing economic models. We're doing, you know, um, movie magic and documentaries. I want to get into this economic transition in some respects and have a discussion with you about it. We've got donut economics. We've got mission economics, circular economy, ecological economics. I mean, capitalism, extractive, and I could go on and on. There's platform, regenerative. How in the hell are we going to make sense of it all? What, 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 you know, what model are we working? All of these models at the same time because we have different futures or what do we hope emerges and what are you dealing with at, at this point in time on, on uh, economic models? Yeah, I love Treconomics and the whole notion. Um, and it, it really demonstrates, as you know, like in Star Trek, you never, you see them go to the bar, you know, Whoopi Goldberg was the bartender in, in Next Generation. You know, uh, uh, Picard didn't get out his credit card to pay for the drink. He asked for a drink, he got a drink. She gave him a drink. She gave him some advice with the drink as well. She didn't charge for that either. Um, but this is, a, this is an example of a, 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 you know, kind of a post a monetary economics that, that I don't have to give you something of mine to get something of yours. It doesn't have to be a direct exchange of value uh, to get that drink. 
And uh, you know, so when we talk about a, a post-monetary economics, the first and most fundamental thing that has to happen, which for most people kind of blows their mind, is that our work and our economic well-being have to be separated. So you, you can't do post-monetary post economics without having some way to have your needs met. And what, what needs are can be widely defined. Um, I want to like get clear about what needs would have to be met for us to even experiment with post-monetary economics. And those needs are the, the fundamentals. And I'd almost call them, uh, you know, like we say, universal basic income. I'd say these are universal basic rights. We should have this notion that everybody has a right, for example, for a safe place, safe, clean place to live uh, where there's not environmental threats. I'm not under threat of floods or, or earthquakes. Uh, where the the construction of my home is safe. It's not a home that's going to fall apart or it doesn't just have dirt for a floor where I actually have a safe home, uh, one that I feel safe in. Um, we certainly have to have access to food and quality food, not just crap food that we get sick and die on. We have to have food that's actually nourishing and sustaining. We have to have uh, health care. We have to have the ability that when we're not well, that we could automatically see somebody about not being well, and they would work to have us be better. And that we'd also have people that were working for us be well when we're not sick. So well care, not sick care. Um, we need to have the ability to have for ourselves and for our children education. Just they could be educated in anything that they had passion about. Um, and so these are kind of the some of the cornerstone pieces of, of what would allow us to go post-monetary. So if those were handled always, if I always had good food, a place to stay, healthcare, education, if I had those things handled no matter what, then I could choose to work on something that had little or no economic exchange. I wouldn't have to earn money if I never had to pay rent. I wouldn't have to earn money if I didn't have to deal with food or education or healthcare, these kind of major things. And so you know, if you think about universal basic income, are we giving people money to participate in a system that's economic based or monetarily based? Or are we just saying, hey, all human beings will have this taken care of. And then what you do with your life is up to you. You get to create your purpose and your meaning for living. And then you get to go out and do that and not be constrained with the things you do because they may or may not make money. As a documentary filmmaker, I have never made any money. <laughs> I have lost money every time I make these films. Economically, it's the worst decision I can make. Now, impact-wise, it's a great decision. But if I didn't have any economic um, constraint, and maybe there was uh, somebody whose their job was to just make sure that, that filmmakers who had great ideas you know, could easily have access to the materials they needed to make ideas, that I would just make a bunch of stuff. I would be... I would be un, uh, unconstrained in the pursuit of my passion and my purpose. Now, that may not work for all human beings. Maybe some human beings are not capable of producing on their own without some kind of you know, extrinsic motivation. I'm gonna say maybe, because I really believe that that working for an extrinsic motivation thing, working to make money to pay the bills is something we've learned. I think in a couple of generations, if nobody ever did that ever again, people would just learn that as you grow up, you've got to find the thing you're passionate about and do that thing. Otherwise, you're going to have a boring life. I mean, who wants to sit at home watching TikTok all day long? Well, maybe a couple of people, but most people would actually go make a contribution to the, the things they find most important. So all of these models that you mentioned, Donut Economics could work with that. Uh, you know, most of these circular economy, all these, you know, like larger economic frameworks could work with that. But to me, it's like that. that's the fundamental move, that the separation from work and money, uh, the separation from survival and work. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that anything good comes from us worrying about our survival day in, day out. And there are, I want to mention, there are different degrees of worrying about our survival. There are literally uh, you know, a billion people on the planet that don't know how they're going to survive tomorrow. Those are our brothers and sisters out there that don't know how they're going to feed their kids tomorrow if they're going to have a safe place to live. That is unacceptable. It's just plain unacceptable. Then there's those of us who feel like we're having to work to survive, even though we actually have a lot of those things taken care of. Um, but there's always this pressure of the future and built into our system. Well, I have enough money today to pay for those things but I don't know what's going to happen in a couple of years or retirement's going to come and then nobody's going to pay for those things for me. We always have this 
this future fear and pressure that someday we may not be surviving. And then I think that's responsible for some of our bad behavior. I'll claw my way over somebody else to make sure my future is, um, is secure. And we'll see this in wealthy people who want to set up trust funds for their kids. They, they, a million dollars is enough. 10 million isn't enough. 75 million is enough. A billion dollars. And maybe now I can secure the survival for myself and for my children, maybe their children's children. But it's a crazy, uh, perverse incentive to like do, do all that is something that we can just handle as humanity. Let's just handle the survival part. Like not just surviving, but everybody actually has a good life as a, a basis. No, you don't get to drive a, a Tesla. Maybe we don't have personalized use of cars to do that kind of thing. I don't know. But that you worry whether your children will be educated or are taken care of or fed at the night, that shouldn't be a human thing anymore. We could engineer that out of existence. So for me, that's like, like now from here, if we can get that as a foundation, we can talk about all kinds of crazy models and all kinds of fun models to incentivize different kinds of behaviors. But if we don't get freed up from that survival pressure that we have, all 8 billion of us, um, it's hard to imagine making the leap to these, these new kinds of value exchange or economics to me. I mean, what do you think, Mark? Well, I, I totally agree. And you also, uh, and not only your introduction, but also in the beginning of our conversation, time is always a factor. Bob Park, Proctor and We Rise Up as well. And, and I think there was one other who, who mentioned it, maybe it was Jack Canfield. Um, basically that we're trading time for money. You know, that is such an inefficient way of living life. And, and it's a, a a really vicious cycle to get into um, how we value our worth and value the, the lifestyle that we create. And so I, I would kind of, I kind of want to go a little bit deeper on what you see that time model is for money and how we maybe shift away from, you know, either the model that you spoke about the universal basic income um, that, that they're working about or some other ideas of what you'd like to see humanity get into to step away from that or get that separation out. And if it's even doable. Yeah, this, so this is, a, this is my favorite research topic right now, time. You know, like who are we as human beings? What is our being in regards to time? And um, a couple, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a couple of nuggets here because it's, imp I just, every time I get a chance to talk about this, there's a couple of people, things I want people to understand first nothing happens in time and we don't trade time for anything because time is not a physical object we only have language to talk about time the way we talk about things and it, but it's not it's like time is not like a football field we can't do anything in it see time is literally what's happening now and the human being and many other species have this memory of time before and an anticipation of time to come. So we have this continuity of living that, that expands more than just this present moment, but not a single one of us has ever lived outside of the present moment. Our, we are completely living as time. We are a living example of time, not in time or through time, but, but literally we are, uh, if you will, a, uh, an embodiment of time as much as we're embodiment of space. And so um, we, we need to start thinking uh, differently about time in order to be able to actually be masters of it and to be able to, to be able to express ourselves fully inside of it. So when we talk about futurism or generative futurism, we're creating this thing called a future, which orients our now moment. Like right now you're smiling because there's a occurring in this now moment that, that is pulling you, drawing you to something greater. That's powerful. If that could affect your mood just by generating a new future from moment to moment, wouldn't that be amazing? We wouldn't have to take drugs anymore. We could just invent new futures that change who we are now. Likewise, we carry around this trauma from the past. These things happened to me. But we know about the human being is that our brain does not record the past. It's a really bad recording instrument. In fact, every time we recall a memory about the past, we rewrite it in the present moment. We, by re-presencing something that happened in the past, it gets recontextualized with the current self or the current moment or the current knowing. And then through uh, you know, cognitive psychology, we, can, we call that reframing. You can take something in the past, you can tell yourself a new story about it, and then you remember it differently. Well, this leads me to believe that there's all kinds of things about our being in time that we just have very, very little access to. 
our old can old model of things happen to me and things will happen to me in time is not very effective it's not very um well maybe that's a, maybe there's a better way to put it it's like a 1.0 model like we had this rudimentary bad model of time that we survived on for a long time and now we've got this new model which allows us to have an affect in the present moment on our ever present past and our ever present future we actually have those things now and we can have a, a, an impact on them. Now, going back to your economics question, if what I am doing is trading time for money, that is both a past based and a, and a well, it's all, all three cases, past based, present, and future based time, uh, conversation. But what's really most important is that that working for money, maybe I've got a job that's not satisfying to me, or maybe I got a job that's really not in, in uh, alignment with my purpose, or maybe I've just got a job that allows me to, to you know, keep my kids fed. Um, in that regard, it's the future that counts the most because it's my anticipation of having to go back to that job day after day after day that I really don't like that doesn't match with me that ends up as stress in the body and then ends up as disease in the body. And then I get sick and I have to take sick days or maybe I get a, a heart condition or I get cancer or something like this. Now, I'm not saying it's causative. I'm not saying that the way your work occurs to you is causative of those things, but it sets the conditions in the body for those things. Versus if, if for example, we had our, our, basic, uh, our basic human rights that we mentioned before operating. And I knew that if I didn't go to work tomorrow, that you know, I maybe, maybe I'd be responsible for helping somebody to do the work that I was supposed to do, or maybe finding somebody that loved doing what I didn't love to do. And then my job was really to find something I love to do. Now, day after day, my story about the past is I always get to orient myself towards the things that are purposeful and meaningful to me. I get to make a contribution. I've gotten to my pet life, make a contribution to the things I think are important. If that was your past and your future was tomorrow, I get to do this amazing thing. That's about a thing I really care about. And I'm going to get to make an impact. Then your now moment, your today that you're, that you were trading for money is now filled with delight and passion. And, you know, like who wouldn't want to live in that world and in that story, that narrative of past, present, and future. So it's not only that we, like there's a lot of people out there selling courses to stop trading your time for money, become an entrepreneur. Now you're gonna trade your time for a dream. It's like, it gets, it gets, it just still, it's still the same model. I'm, ask, I'm saying that what we really need to trade in is, our, is our, our way of seeing ourselves in time. Now, let's say you have a, a job that you have to do to put money, food on the table. You know, we don't have a, we don't yet have a universal basic rights for, for your welfare. Um, it may be that you want to in a future, and you see this a lot in immigrant families, like uh, uh, somebody who comes into uh, Europe or, or the West uh, from a, an economically disadvantaged country, and then they work really hard to put their kids through college to get them to medical school. And their life becomes about, it's hard work, but I'm doing it for a future I believe in. Now they're generating a future for their children. And you'll see those kids do really, really great. That next generation, like they've got such amazing energy um, because of the work of their parents and the work, the reason their parents made that work is they had a future that they really cared about. So even doing, even doing hard work in the present moment, if it's in service to a future you really care about, it's not so hard. It's not, it's not, not so difficult. Now it may not be fun and maybe we don't always do fun things. In fact, I've had them to do lots of hard things that weren't fun for things that I really deeply cared about. So that's a, a bad, a bad model. But, um, that's, that's really what I, I hope to teach people about the way we operate in time, we, the way a human being operates in time. Uh, you know, um, and there's a lot more to say about that. I'm working on a book about it. Yeah. One day you'll see it'll be out there. <laughs> we'll, we'll have longer conversations about it, but it's an obsession that I have right now. So I think if we can change that view, it's quite possibly we change the way we, we live, that we change the way we exist uh, at a, at a, more fundamental level than economics or politics or these other things we're talking about at a, a being level or a, the occurring of being, or how does being occur to me? The being a human being, the way it occurs is alters or changes. Humanity's done that a bunch of times. It's not new for human beings, but uh, it's kind of maybe time for, it's time for a new view of time. <laughs> it, it definitely is. And I, I love the way you set it up. And it also ties to what we began with, with the, the vision and purpose. You also have a vision and purpose in there. And sometimes you get to see that fulfillment 
the example you gave of the children being able to go to college and, and see that future, there's a sense of joy and fulfillment through all that hard work and maybe sacrifice during that time to, to see the achievement of that vision um, where, where they're working on generational success of their, their community, their family yep. unit. And, and so there's a lot of nice things. That also um, is a nice transition for us to really talk about generative futurism, fu you as a futurist. Um, I'm also a futurist, and I, I believe there's a cure, pure vision, a roadmap, a plan for most futurists. So not mm -hmm. only can we do backcasting, use foresight modeling, and all the tools of futurism, but we also, have, you know, whether we're talking about space or going to the moon or whatever, those are visions of the future that have a roadmap and plan of actions and things to do that we might tweak along the way, but eventually end up in that future date or time, you know, specifically going to Mars now they're you know they're talking it takes a while to get there and there's a process and adjustments in trajectory and maybe the slingshot effect you know uh, that occur along the way but those are all scientific and, and math actions that help us achieve that vision you first have to set that vision and that desire that something you want to do and then figure out the how in between We've been yeah. in many, many, many areas in, in, in our world, in our lives before where we had that vision, but we didn't know how the hell we we're going to get there. We didn't have the tools and technologies, computing power and innovation to get to the moon when JFK set that vision. We're at the same time and similar situation now with the sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement. Eight years left to go, a decade before we, we have to get there. And we have a lot of the tools and innovations already exist. The roadmap exists. We're just still kind of waiting on the implementation to get us there to execute. Um, but it's a very similar thing. And we're, we're in this conundrum or this situation over and over in history. Uh, it's kind of how we work. But uh, I want you to tell us more about generative futurism and what you do and what the concept is and You've tickled on it a little bit, but let, let's move a little bit more there. Yeah. A um, couple of things that you said that provoked for me that uh, parents working for their children, the multi-generational thing. Um, one of the things that I, that I lead a lot of workshops on and, and try to get people to do is imagine futures that are happening long after they're gone. Um, you know, a generation, two, three, four, five after they're gone. And by the way, most of the time within three to four generations, your name is forgotten. Now, maybe you had a nickname like, uh, you know, grandpa or something like that. And they will remember grandpa or great grandpa as a name, but they might actually forget, you know, like as your, as your survivors start dying themselves, people forget the name. Now it might be written down. It might be able to do genealogy and see it, but nobody remembers uh, your name the way, your wife or kids remember your name today, right? It's not, not present anymore. So one of, the, uh, one of the tests for me about is something of benefit to humanity is to say, well, is it a benefit? Uh, if I was no longer here and could no longer personally benefit from it, would humanity benefit? So I'm not cheating. I'm not saying this would be great for humanity. And boy, it'd be good for me too. You know, I could get a lot of benefit out of that. Now I'm saying you you don't want to do that, but if you want to really get to notions that are purely for humanity, then take them out a hundred years, really look out, you know, a long ways. Um, there's, there's no benefit to you at that point. Also, there's no capacity to predict. I mean, most predictive futurists, anyone that's any good will predict, you know, two years out, maybe three, 18 months to three years is about all they're willing to stick their necks out for, because if they don't predict, predict accurately, then they're not really good at predictive futurism. Their, their, their ability to predict what's going to happen is what they stake their, um, their reputation on. Now, you might be a guy like Ray Kurzweil who predicts the singularity, um, but the singularity is like, it's, it's such a, um, it's kind of a, such a ridiculous concept in a way that he can get away with it. And so it, it borders on generative futurism. He starts to see, well, that's not, He's predicting it, but he's not really predicting it because we don't even understand enough about 
computers and computing power and how they would be able to to um, you know, to be uh, able to be you know fueled for you know long periods of time. And I have an no idea how you could, if you could ever get a person inside of there because we don't know what consciousness is. So we don't even know how you could capture it and put it somewhere other than a human body. Um, but there's a there's this thing, like you said, Mars. Right now we have a plan to get to Mars. When Jules Verne wrote about Mars, we just knew there was a planet called Mars and through our telescopes, we knew it was red. That's all we knew about it. And then when he talked about taking a rocket ship there and meeting Martians and all that stuff, that was pure speculation based upon imagination. And that's giving us a little bit more of the feeling of generative futurism. If I were to take something, let's say uh, energy, I'm going to say, okay, one of the things we know about energy is that uh, human beings have been on a trajectory of consuming more and more and more of it with each passing decade. And at the same time, the production of that energy is, is causing greater and greater damage and externalities to the planet. If we continue to increase energy consumption, we'll run out of energy producing methods that are current methods. Now you could say, hey, we're going to um, you know, increase renewables. Well, renewables also recall nat re require natural resources. You can't get solar panels without digging stuff out of the ground. Well, you want to cover the planet in, in disposable uh, uh, solar panels? Well, probably can't do that either. So now we hit a breaking point. We, can't, we can no longer predict or really see how clearly to get the kind of energy we need. So maybe as a generative futurist, I would say, okay, the first thing is that there seems to be two parts to this equation. One is energy consumption. Like, could we imagine a future in which people could be really, really happy consuming 20% of the energy they consume today? Now, maybe some of that's driven to efficiency. We could find a way to get the things that they do that, that cause, you know, for example, when we move from incandescent bulbs to uh, LED bulbs, we got more efficiency. So maybe it could be through efficiency and maybe it could be through behavior and lifestyle as well. Maybe we have, maybe we go to a diurnal, uh, a diurnal day where we live with daylight more. I don't know. Uh, you could imagine it really quickly. Um, and then you could begin to plot, well, what would that be like? And then you could also say, well, there's lots of abundant energy out there in the universe. There's a, you know, like the universe doesn't have a, a lack of energy. It's dissipating. It's, it's being, you know, uh, entropically disappearing through heat, but we could, we could catch that wave. We could ride that universal wave of energy. Um, so maybe I want to say that while we became more efficient, we also became able to harness the, the, the universal energy that's out there. So a predictive futurist would never enter into this domain. How do we, how do we you know, intercept uh, you know, universal energy? It could be solar energy, it could be just the movement of the planets through space uh, because the, the problem has no engineering solutions. But a generative futurist could say, well, what are the domains that would be interesting? Well, let's talk to somebody who deals in space. Let's talk to some people who deal in engineering. Let's talk about what, I need a physicist here really quickly so we can talk about what am I talking about when I talk about engineers and just energy, it's just solar. And then we could together invent a story about how we did it. Well, what we did is we learned to get things that were able, how do we get the energy to the ground? Well, we, we don't know how we do it today, but we, imagine, we imagined something like this happen. We start imagining parts and pieces. And as we imagine those pieces, suddenly they become more like engineering problems. We go from something that's completely indescribable to a bunch of imagined parts and pieces. And then we start to say, oh, but that one we can actually make some progress on. We'd have to first figure out how to, to transmit energy from space to the ground. Well, I know some people at work in that arena, let's go talk to them. Um, and so this is a process of, of using imagination to create futures that are not possible or not likely to happen because nobody dared to dream them up. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the couple pieces of it, one is dreaming big and dreaming long term. Uh, now, for a company, that may only be five years, by the way. Uh, most, most of the organizations I work with that do this, five years is plenty big enough. I, I worked with a bank that did 10 years last year. It was you know, tre tremendous for them to be thinking of themselves 10 years out. Um, you know, a science fiction writer could do a, a thousand years in the future pretty easy. So we have a lot of capacity to imagine futures. Um, but the process of imagining suddenly creates things that become possible. So when Jules Verne talked about flying to, the, to, to Mars, it was a, a dream. There wasn't even a thing called a spaceship. But suddenly in the minds of 
of young kids born of that age reading his work, suddenly there was a thing called a spaceship. It hadn't been built yet, but Jules Verne said it could work. Like he brought it to life for me as a story. And now I start working on, you know, maybe a young Werner von Braun starts working on, well, and I, I don't know if you know Werner's story, but he said, I don't care what I build as long as it gets me closer to inventing something that can get us to the moon. He's obsessed with it. Now he did a lot of stuff that he probably shouldn't have invented and it was used to ends that weren't great. But that's the that's kind of this imaginative power that we can harness through through this process of generative futurism. Now it doesn't replace traditional you know forecasting and and uh, uh, you know uh, predictive futurism. It's not meant to do that. It's just meant to give us longer time frames to make more bold and audacious claims about what we could do as human beings. Um, and uh, I, I I'm obsessed with long term futures. I mean, I, I would love to see us uh, hit the SDG goals. I think it would be great. And it's probably fundamental to human survival. But I would like to see us go a lot further than that. I'd like to see a work, world that really works for everything. I'd like to see human beings that, that your birthplace on the planet not di dictate what kind of life you're going to have. It, just because you're, you're born in Nigeria, Nigeria doesn't mean you should have less of a life than if you're born in Oklahoma. And it's it should be irrelevant. You should be able to have a, a great human life and a great expression. Well, so how do we get to there? Well, I say we get there by starting to imagine what it would look like for somebody in Nigeria to have the same um, uh, rights as somebody who lives in Oklahoma. We've talked about that already in the past. And fortunately, through the time of me doing this, I've been doing this with organizations for about 10 years. I've found a lot of tools for doing this. And what I, one of the things I've discovered is that anybody can imagine amazing futures. You don't have to be like somebody who's got a writing degree or somebody who's a visual artist. You know, I, I've, I've had, uh, I run these um, multi-stakeholder events where you have everybody from like low levels in organization to the CEO, you've got customers and vendors. Uh, we bring in outside interest groups if they're there and we have them together imagine a future. And sometimes the, the things that come out of people's mouths, um, it's just led me to believe that we all are a genius like this. We're all genius at imagining bold futures. We just don't do it because it's not acceptable or there's no place in industry for a long-term vision that's not from an economist or from an operations specialist or a subject matter specialist. Um, so I think it's a I think it's a human gift, the ability to, to imagine futures. Then then we have to get into like, well, what how would how would we backcast in there? What would we make real? How would, what would what's the first steps we would take in the next decade? What would we have to invent to get that to happen? And then all of that human ingenuity and engineering stuff gets piled onto it. But like the SDGs, we have to have somebody declare where we're going, like the SDGs, like Kennedy putting a man on the moon, like Nelson Mandela, you know, removing apartheid. Somebody has to say it can happen. And then we can begin figuring out how to do it. And so my passion is really getting people and organizations or just one-on-one -on -one to imagine those kind of futures. And then vis-a-vis -vis the conversation we just had, once that future is in place, just like having that purpose in some place, now there's all of these courses of action that are available to you. And when you look at, should I take this job or that job, or should I choose to invest in this or that? You know, because it will that realize the future I wanna realize. Everything becomes crystal clear based upon the future that's calling you or the future that you invented. And um, yeah, wow. I, if, you, if you ask me, do I have hope for humanity? I say, absolutely, because we can imagine things that don't exist today. We can imagine our way out of all these problems. And then we can come together in groups and engineer that thing out of existence or engineer another thing into existence. But we have to believe it's possible. You've touched on it a couple of times and you've, uh, you've, you've answered it in, in a few ways. The hardest question I always ask all my guests is, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And so mm -hmm. I believe you have that, that vision. I'd like you to answer it for us. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Michael, Sean? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll start with the, those basic rights and I want to add one to it. And that's the right to, to, to do meaningful work. Uh, that, that the right to, to have a, a meaningful life with purpose. Um, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that, you know, especially racism and colonialism destroyed. We went to Africa and said, you aren't people, you're animals. You, you have no meaning. You have no gift to give to the world um, besides maybe the sweat of your back. And, you know, the, those are wrongs that, that, that still percolate in our consciousness. And so a world that works for everything, everyone means that 
<laughs> for me, that would mean as an individual, someplace on the planet, from zero to 130 years in age, that they wake up in the morning, they feel like they belong in the world, like they have a place, and they feel like their life has meaning, that they fit into this human world, this animal world, this multi-species world, and that they have a place in it, they belong and they can contribute. Um, if that happened for every individual, then we wouldn't have to do any surveys to find out if the world worked for everybody. Everybody would be living a fulfilled life. Um, I think also, I want to just add one thing. If, if, if your listeners haven't read James Carson's James Carse's book, uh, Finite and Infinite Games, um, read that. Because the other thing is, is that any system we design, humans tend to try to figure out how to make the system work better for themselves than others or better for my kids than others. It's just a it's just a, a kind of a leftover trait from how we, we came up historically. Um, so we also have to have in that world that works for everything, uh, systems that change the rules, that change the way things work such that nobody can win out over other people. Um, we can't have me at the expense of you in a world that works for everything. It has to be that I get these great things and you get these great things too, that this world is, is available to all of us and none of us have uh, privilege over the other. And until we get that, really until we get that, I just want to get flat. We don't get it for ourselves. All we get is a, a bad version of it. A, I can fly around in my you know, $40 million jet and burn jet fuel and I can, I can buy a yacht that could you know, fit a small village in, in Somalia inside of it. I can do that and maybe it's cool, but ultimately I'm going to get bored of that yacht. And ultimately that plane is not going to get me where I want to go. Ultimately, I'm not going to be able to get anywhere. I'm not going to be able to get away from my suffering fast enough or to waste to, away to some kind of joyful experience fast enough. I will never have enough money to do that. But if I had uh, a loving community, an ability to work meaningful in the world and a world that was flourishing, it'd be really hard to not be satisfied with that. I think you could find some outliers that would be really unhappy, but I think for the most part, um, We'd, uh, we'd fundamentally alter what it meant to be a human being inside of that. We would no longer be fighting for our lives. It would no longer be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It would be a world where I looked around and thought, wow, we're doing good here. Exactly what we talked about in so many ways today, and, and it's so nice that when you have that vision, uh, which is also kind of a way of having a why and a purpose, mm -hmm. um, and, and you can articulate that, um, it's really just a better model. It's a better way for us to get there. It's a brighter future. It's really desirable. I, I want to be there. I, I know that's a world that works for everyone. Um, I, I am all out of questions. I actually have one last one left. I think I know the answer already. Um, but other than that, we, we've talked long. We could talk for hours. I mean, we need to talk about uh, economic models even more and about I'm also doing a book after um, my book, Menu B, on economic models as well. Right. We've kind of tickled upon it, but that's probably another whole nother series that we could talk about. Um, Matter of fact, I just had another podcast today that was talking about this new book, Supercharge Me. It was also about new economic models and, right. and things. So it's always something. But I really want to know for, for you, what have you experienced or learned in this journey? And you've met so many people uh, in this journey so far. And, I, and I'm sure the journey has been a real important part in and of itself. But is there anything that you would have loved to know from the start or wished that you'd either started sooner or found out sooner um, mm. in this journey that you say, oh, boy, I wish I knew that from the beginning or I wish I would have learned that sooner? Yeah, um, yeah both, I'd say that the thing I wish I had been born into maybe in a, a larger way. And I want to say, I had, you know, great parents, they were hippies. I had a, a kind of very eclectic and odd childhood. It was wonderful. But, um, you know, the, the piece that I didn't get to much later in life, and really I think I'm, you know, as part of my daily meditation is, is the piece about compassion. 
And just get that, hey, yeah, life is, is hard for you. It, it's a struggle sometimes. It's hard for me. It's a struggle for me sometimes. Um, and it's that way for all human beings. You know, even that person that you're upset and angry with because they did X, Y, and Z, cut you off in a lane of traffic or whatever, you know, that, that they too are enduring, you know, hard times in their, their world. And that as long as we pit our own happiness against the happiness of another person, we're not likely to get there. Um, we're likely to take advantage of situations and hurt people. Now, if we're taking advantage and hurting people, then other people are taking advantage and we're going to get hurt. It's just a, it's just a, a vicious cycle. And uh, I just see so much to be gained in looking at every time you're upset about somebody or something somebody's done or something that's happened in the world to just take a moment and say, wow, that's a human being. They're suffering. You know, they're struggling with things. And I recognize in myself struggling and, and working through things. And one of the, the greatest things in life is having a friend, maybe like you, Mark, that I say, man, I'm struggling with stuff. And you say, wow, that, tell me about it. I want to know. Maybe I can help. Oh, I got a great insight on that. And, you know, we, we work a lot in the domains of competition. We work a lot in the domains of trying to get ahead in life. Um, and it's just looking in the wrong direction. We really need to be looking towards each other and how we can be in service to each other, how we can be compassionate, how we can listen. And then when we need help, how we can ask for help. And then when we do something wrong, we do something that we're embarrassed of. Uh, we do something that, that isn't us at our best self, that we're also able to be compassionate to ourselves and say, wow, I'm a human being. I'm suffering. I'm dealing with things. I get how it fell apart in that moment. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. In fact, it just means that I did something I'm not proud of. And so, you know, I, it's, it's the other compassion is the other side of the glove of love, right? It's they, they're, they're front of the hand, back of the hand. You know, you, you can't be a loving person without being a compassionate person. And so uh, maybe, maybe I should take that back, Mark. Maybe I did learn about it early enough. I was a Zen Buddhist in my early 20s. You know, it just didn't seem like when they said people were suffering, I I got that, but I didn't get it like in my, my heart or my gut. Now, like I'm now in my fifties, like I see some people, I, I do a lot of coaching and often somebody comes to me with a problem and all I can, I like, oh man, they're suffering. And I get it so clearly. And then the solutions that come from my, that compassionate point of view or stance are always um, generative. They always create a better future. But if I were just trying to help somebody get ahead or, you know, in a, a leadership conflict. I, I, I coach leaders, you know, at times, if I were just teaching them to get ahead, then I'd just be perpetrating the same old system. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I won't say yet, Mark, that compassion is one of my superpowers, but it's one I'm working on really, really hard. Cause it's one, if I were to get to the finish line of this life and feel like I had that as a superpower, maybe not born with it, but I, I, I live my life in service of becoming that, that would be the one I would want to have. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. If if one of us, any one of humanity is suffering, we're all suffering. Um, there, there, there is no model um, that if anyone is suffering, that we're all going to succeed. It's it's got to be a games theory of a win win for all. There's this beautiful Sanskrit word, and I wanted to mention to you earlier uh, in our discussion because. It, it, it was good and I, um, it was a good point, but it's even better now because you surmised the whole thing. There's this old Sanskrit word that's called seva, selfless mm -hmm. service to life. And I've added a little, my own word to the beginning of that regeneration or regenerative selfless service to life. And it mm -hmm. is so true um, because it's just a better model. It's not yeah. only compassion, it really works. And it puts us on that exponential positive roadmap towards this desirable, beautiful future. And everything that you've discussed, everything that we've talked about here today really sets us on that path and gives me the vision. I'm on board, I'm sold, I'm with you. Let's do this, let's hit the critical mass. Michael, Sean, we rise up. Fabulous filmmaker. Thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas and for your time. It was a sheer pleasure. That's all I have. And I really appreciate this discussion today. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think um, 
uh, you give me a, a reason to live just being in this conversation with you and uh, such an admirer of, of your work and, and what you stand for in the world. Um, I'm looking forward to more great times together. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate it. Take care. Talk to you later. Thank you.